Please be seated. When was the last time you read something in the book of Proverbs? This morning. This morning. Whoa, gosh, you're a great congregation. I can just go sit down. Uh, somebody said they read a chapter every day because there's 31 chapters and in the month. But it's an amazing book, isn't it? Now, some of you know that in our Anglican denomination, we have a calendar of scripture readings. So every Sunday, we have um, some readings. We have three years we go through the Bible. And one year, it's a lot of Matthew and a lot of Mark and a lot of Luke. And, the three, and then John is sprinkled for the Gospels. But did you know that in all those three years, all those 156 weeks, only one weekend in those three years has a reading from Proverbs? And today's the day. I didn't know that. So it's so important for us to really look at the whole book of Proverbs and not just gloss over it. So I'm going to give you an overview of the book and then a prayer and then I'll have a sermon. The word proverb is a short, clever saying that contains some wisdom. And there's a lot of them. Do you know there's 595 proverbs in the book of Proverbs? Now, if you read one a day, which are the weekdays, and three on Saturday and three on Sunday, you get through them in all year. But I encourage you to read more. But they're really rich and they're really full of wisdom. And they're mainly in the middle of the book. You see, in Proverbs, the first nine chapters introduce King Solomon, who asks God, for wisdom to lead Israel. And he's written thousands of these proverbs. And he says that by reading this book, you and I reading this book, we can gain wisdom for our life. And this wisdom is not just knowledge, but it's applied knowledge. So if I asked you, would you rather be smart or wise? What would you say? Hopefully wise. Because, you see, smart people know a lot of information, but wise people know how to use that information. I think someone told me once that a guy came to fix their TV, and it was a $200 bill. This is back in the old days. And he said, well, the part was 50 cents, but knowing where to put it, <laughs> that's what the bill was. It's how to use information. Smart people know a lot, but wise people actually know how to use it in the right way for life. And there's a big difference between the two. So the book of Proverbs helps us to learn how to use information in the right way. How to develop practical skills to live well in God's world. The first nine chapters are ten speeches from a father to a son. Telling him all about, hey, you're being called to wisdom and warning against evil. And then it has four poems in these first nine chapters from a person called Lady Wisdom. Creative poems that explore God's moral universe, that goodness and justice are real things and not something we should ignore. Now, this book is not just some good advice, but this is God's invitation to you and me to learn wisdom so that we can live well. And then the next 20 chapters from 10 to 29 are all these proverbs, just proverb after proverb after proverb that apply wisdom to every area of life, family, work, neighborhood, friendship, sex, marriage, anger, money, forgiveness, alcohol, death, everything. You can find a, pro a proverb for almost everything that's going on in your life right now. They're short. They're easy to memorize. And, and this section of Proverbs is like a reference book that we keep turning to through the years for wisdom. Many of them teach a basic principle, kind of like what I was talking about to the children. Make good choices and things will go well for you. Make foolish choices and your life won't go so well. Can you identify with that? <laughs> How many of us have experienced that in our own lives? But these Proverbs are probabilities, not promises. There are no guarantees, just guidelines. Because we know that lots of things can and often do go wrong in our world. So these proverbs are focusing on the general rule. You know, most of the time, if you do this right things, a good result will happen. But we all know people who, you know, lived right, but ter terrible things happen. So there's two other books in the Bible that are part of the wisdom books. One is called Job. If you've ever read that, 
and Ecclesiastes. Those two books deal with the exceptions to the rule, and Proverbs deal with the general rule. So we really need to read all of the wisdom books to get God's total view and God's big picture. And then the last two chapters, 30 and 31, are a collection of poems. The most famous one is chapter 31 about the features of a godly woman. So these Proverbs are for every person, every one of us, in every season of our life. It's a guide for living wisely and living well in God's world. That's an overview. So now let's pray. Lord, bless our understanding of chapter 9 and in the context of all the Proverbs. Open our hearts to desire wisdom, to recognize with humility that we lack wisdom in many areas of our life and need your guidance and direction. So anoint this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I start with a question. Have you ever come to a fork in the road? Hmm? Have you ever come to a fork in the road and you had to choose you either go this way or you go this way? Well, a lot of us have. And the Bible is full of forks in the road. So often, when you get to that fork in the road, the decision is a life-changing one. For instance, Joshua in the Old Testament, he tells the people, you must choose. Pick which one of the local gods that you will serve. But Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Some of you have that in a plaque on your house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, you got to choose. You can enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there are many who take it. Or you can choose the other gate. The gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. And then Paul, writing in the New Testament, he warns the Corinthians, each builder must choose with care how to build, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. So throughout the Bible, you see these these forks in the road, these decision-making, we know what that's like, right? Because some decisions that we make can change the course of our life. We've all made them. How about will I go to school? What will be my major? What job or career will I choose? Will I work hard? Will I do everything that my boss says? Who will I marry if that possibility comes? Where will I live? Will I move out of state to that new job? On and on and on, the list is endless. Maybe some of you are facing a life-changing choice right now, a major fork in the road. But now turn with me to Proverbs chapter 9, because Proverbs chapter 9 is the description of one of those forks in the road. We come to a major decision point. Our decision will undergird all that we think and do from now on, every decision we make. It's a fork in the road and we have a totally life-changing decision to make. In chapter 9, we meet two women. One of them is called Lady Wisdom, and the other one is called Lady Folly. They're standing on each branch of the fork in the road. And each one makes an offer to those who would turn their way. It reminds me of when I was in Israel. I was in Jerusalem. I was in the old city, and I was looking for some souvenirs. And I was walking down the narrow streets and walking past many shops, and all these merchants were kind of looking at me. Oh, gosh, here's an American tourist. Big bucks. He's coming. We want him to come into our shop. And they were beckoning me. They were trying to lure me in away from the competitors. And every one of them claimed that they had the best prices and they had the best products. And I remember I wanted a, a chess set made of, of beautiful stone, and it was like $900. And today, you can't walk into Walmart pick up a toaster, go to customer service and say, hey, it says $14, I'll offer you nine. <laughs> you can't bargain like that. I mean, it's priced the way it is. But there, you know, there, it, it's part of the sale. It's part of the process. You, you offer a price and then they come down and then you move up and, and you, you argue and you bargain and so forth to try to, it's part of the process. And it was kind of fun, except that I didn't know how I was going to ship it back. So when I got them from 900 down to 200, I decided just to forego the whole deal. He was not happy. <laughs> but I walked down, and more shopkeepers were beckoning me in. And that's what it's like in Proverbs 9. You have these two women calling out 
to those in the streets, inviting them to come into their houses and each advertising what they have to offer. But look at verse 1. The woman called Wisdom lives in a rock-solid house with seven pillars, the Bible said. That gives a, a sense of real stability. This is not like the house on the sand at the end of Matthew's um, uh, Sermon on the Mount, but it's the one built on the rock. It says she's prepared a table full of choice meat and fine wine, and she sends out messengers to shout from the highest point of the city. That was probably the gate where everyone gathered. Let all who are simple come in here. Come, eat my food and the drink and wine I've mixed. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of understanding. But later in the chapter, beyond what we read here this morning, the woman called Folly is also calling in very much of a similar way. Let all who are simple come in here. Stolen water is sweet. Food eaten in secret is delicious. So in this chapter 9, we have two invitations, two choices, two claims to truth, two ways of approaching life, two destinies. These two calls summarize the whole first nine chapters of Proverbs. And these two calls lead into the next 20 chapters of all these individual Proverbs that deal with all of life. Now compare these two women. Right? If you're going to make a choice, how many of you have gone, I'm going to look at a blender here, and I've got it down to these two. And you start looking at them, and you compare them. Or two cars, you know, and you look at all the features and the price. And how, we do that all the time, don't we? Every time you go into a restaurant, it's like, well, let's see, do I get the turkey or the salmon? And you're looking at We compare all the time. So compare these two women. One of them has prepared a meal of her own. The other one has stolen hers. Wisdom serves wine. Folly serves stolen water. Wisdom sends out her servants to invite those who come. Folly is loud and rowdy and uses profanity to lure people in. Wisdom calls those who are on the wrong path to come walk on the right path. But folly is calling those who go straight in their way to leave their straight path and follow her. Wisdom's invitation leads to life. Folly's invitation leads to death. And this is a clear picture of what's happening in our world today, in our culture. There's two philosophies of life calling for the world's attention. One is the way of wisdom, and the other is the way of folly. There are two worldviews competing for our loyalty, and both claim to be the right way. If you're looking up to this presidential election, you've got two completely different groups, two completely different directions, two completely different platforms. And they won't necessarily tell you the truth, and they'll use words with different meanings, but there's two different destinies. If you choose one, you're going to end up over here. If you choose another one, you're going to end up over here. That's what these two women are calling. They want you to follow them. Which path are you going to choose? One appeals to our mind. That's the way of wisdom. The other way appeals to our feelings, and that's folly. One believes in truth, God's truth. The other one says you can make up any truth you want. Each person should be able to create their own truth just as they want it to be. So you can say 2 plus 2 is 4. I'm going to say 2 plus 2 is 17. And they're both equally authentic. I can say I believe in biology. You can say you don't believe in biology and you're something else. Those are two different ways. One believes that God's laws are the path to life, and the other one believes God's laws are, are irrelevant. They're old-fashioned. They're harsh. They're burdensome. They're pointless. Two calls. One is the call of the wise, and one is the call of the wild. And i got to tell you that a lot of people have trouble telling the difference between the call of the wise and the call of the wild. Our country is standing at the fork in the road today. Each one of us is part of that fork in the road, and we each have to choose two competing worldviews. And how do we decide? How do we choose? Well, I believe that wisdom is calling out to us today. She's calling out to us today in the same way that she did in the book of Proverbs. 
And if you read the whole chapter, you see that her first invitation is a call to fear the Lord. The pivotal verse is in chapter 9. It's verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. I'm going to ask you this morning, do you fear the Lord? Do you fear the Lord? Ask yourself that question, because it's a very important question. It's more popular today to dwell on the love of the Lord than the fear of the Lord. But a proper fear is the right response to the judge of the universe. Now, I'm not talking about terror. This fear is not about terror. It's about a healthy sense of reverence and awe for God. It's about recognizing our place in the universe. It's about a moral mindset that recognizes that I am not God. I had a poster in my office in my first church many years ago. And it said, there's only two things you have to know in life. There is a God, and you are not him. <laughs> Everything else is <laughs> after that. This proper fear is a realization that I don't get to make up my own definitions of good and evil and right and wrong. I don't know about you, but there's a great temptation to do that, to rationalize, to say, oh, it's not really wrong. Everybody else is doing it. I says, well, I follow the big laws. This healthy fear of the Lord is, is our call to humble ourselves, humble ourselves before God and embrace God's definition of right and wrong, even if sometimes that's uncomfortable and inconvenient. For example, have you ever started to do something wrong? Maybe this week, think about it. Have you ever started to do something wrong? In fact, you were doing it privately so that no one else would know. You start to do something wrong, and then you stop. You stop. And you change your mind. Because you have this, this, this sense that someone is looking over your shoulder. You just kind of feel a pair of eyes. And you knew that that someone was God. That's the value of a proper fear of the Lord. I've experienced that many times in my life. It's kind of like a check. I'm heading in one direction, and oops, that's not the right way. God watches out for us that way. Yeah, sometimes our spouse does, too, with a little nudge. <laughs> Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. Now, there's so much more I could say about the book of Proverbs. I want to encourage you to go online, and there is a uh, thing called the Bible Project. And it's a little, uh, almost like a, a, um, a chart that someone draws different things about the book, and he talks through it. It's about eight minutes long. Just do a web search for Bible Project, and then just put in one of the books of the Bible. They're always so helpful. But it gives a picture of the book of Proverbs and kind of has all the pieces come together. It's wonderful. But I don't have time to go into all the rest of the book, but I just want to say that if you come back up to like the 35,000-foot level and look at the whole of the Bible, we learn something really, really important. And that is that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of every proverb in this book. He is the ultimate source of wisdom. He is the one from which all wisdom proceeds. The call of Christ is the call to wisdom. And it's interesting that when Jesus calls us, he calls us very much like the woman of wisdom. He invites us into his house. He says, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And just like the woman of wisdom, Jesus calls us to a great banquet. Luke 14 tells the parable where Jesus sends servants out into all the highways and byways to call the blind and the crippled and the poor and the lame, everyone to come in. And of course, there's some that have excuses. Oh, I just got married, or I just bought a new car, or I just did something else. There are those who won't come, but he calls all of us. And then at this great banquet that Jesus calls us to, he's prepared the bread and the wine at great personal cost. And you know those words. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And we all know what that means. Every time that we come to Holy Communion, we get an earthly foretaste of that heavenly banquet. So this chapter of Proverbs gives us two invitations. One ends in life. The other 
ends in death. Wisdom and folly still call in the streets today. Every person, every one of us in this room will attend one of these two banquets. If you answer the call of the wise, you will be at the banquet eternally with Christ in heaven. And if you answer the call of the wild, you will end up in the banquet of the grave. If you look at the end of the chapter, folly talks about sitting with corpses. It's not a very pleasant banquet. But Jesus invites you and I into his house. He invites us to his banquet. But make no mistake, when an invitation comes, you need to answer it. How many of you have gotten an invitation and didn't do anything? How many of you have sent out invitations for an event and some people didn't respond? C.S. Lewis says this, and this is very, very wise. When you have to make a choice and don't make it, that in itself is a choice. Not to decide is to decide. If you don't vote on November 5th, you have voted. You've made a choice. You've affected the direction of this country. So please don't do that. <laughs> please be sure to vote. So my final question is, what are we going to choose? The Bible is full of these forks in the road. Each one of us faces forks in the road every day, little ones, big ones. What are we going to choose? We can be wise or we can be foolish. As your pastor, I want you to make the right decision. God wants all of us to learn to be wise. In fact, verse 9 in this chapter 9 says it plainly. Give instruction to the wise and they will become wiser still. Teach the righteous and they will gain in learning. Two choices face us. Two claims of truth. Two worldviews. The way of wisdom or the way of folly. The wise choose to fear God and follow him. The wise choose life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would stir up in every one of us a curiosity and a hunger for wisdom. That we would make it our lifelong goal, if we haven't already, from this moment on, to become more and more wise. Thank you for forgiving us and for bailing us out of our previous foolish choices or teaching us lessons. But Lord, you've given us so many lessons directly in your, in your scriptures. Help us to dig into the scriptures, especially in the book of Proverbs, that your Holy Spirit would give us wisdom and understanding into these wonderful nuggets of wisdom. Thank you for this reminder that this next three years when we don't read anything publicly on Proverbs, that each one of us will be reading Proverbs over and over again so that we might know the way of wisdom and the way of life. We pray in your name.